I'm Phuc Lam. And I am Fernando Trejo Suarez. And I'm John Havlin, and we're going to be talking about um, completeness of a generalization of Fibonacci sequences and a specific analytic approach. So to start things off, um, we're going to define which generalization of the Fibonacci sequence we're going to use. Uh, these are called positive linear recurrence sequences, and they satisfy two properties. The first is a recurrence relation, which is a homogeneous linear recurrence with non-negative coefficients, where the first and last coefficients are positive. Um, so to specify the initial conditions, what we do is we start off with one for the first term, and then for the next uh, L terms, we use a truncated version of the full recurrence to generate these terms because we don't have L terms to work with yet. So since we're going to be talking about a lot of different sequences of this form, um, it's useful to be able to refer to them just by their coefficients. And so the notation we're going to use is just brackets in uh, a list of the coefficients of the recurrence. So um, for example, the Fibonacci numbers would be 1, 1. Um, also interesting to note is that the definition of a PLRS, positive linear recurrence sequence, gives uh, F1 equals 1 and F2 equals 2 as initial conditions rather than the usual 1, 1. We move to the definition of completeness. So a sequence of positive integer is called complete if every positive integer is the sum of its terms using each term at most once. So for example, the sequence with the recurrence 1, 3 using the bracket notation as introduced before is not complete because when we look at the first few terms of the sequence, which are 1, 2, 5, 11, for example, we cannot get 4 or 9. On the other hand, though, the Fibonacci sequence 1, 1 is complete. This follows directly from Zickendorf's theorem. So next, we move to um, a special sequence called the doubling sequence. So the PLS generated by 2, which follows the which has this re recurrence relation where a term is twice its previous term is complete because every integer has a binary representation. So a theorem given by Brown is that the complete sequence with maximal terms is the doubling sequence in terms of the doubling sequence given above. And there's actually a very nice combinatorial proof for this. So for example, suppose a complete sequence GN exceeds the doubling sequence at some point. So as there are only two to the k minus one, minus one different ways to sum the terms from g1 to gk minus one, and the set of integers from one to gk minus one contains at least two to the k minus one integer, we see that there must be some integer in that set which cannot be written as the sum of the um, terms from g1 to gk minus one. And so our proof is done. Brown gave a crucial theorem when we're talking about complete sequences, which is a necessary and sufficient condition for a non-decreasing sequence to be complete. Specifically, we need the first term to be one and every term after that to be bounded above by the sum by one plus the sum of the previous term. So we will now move on to um, Benet's formula and its generalizations. Um, so firstly, we introduce um, the characteristic polynomial. So and every, every single uh, PLRS defined by a certain, uh, sort of certain set of coefficients can be related to a specific polynomial, which is a polynomial of degree L, uh, where it, it, which is x to the L minus, and then you go through the coefficients multiplied by different powers of the exponent, where the constant term is the last coefficient. And so, well, by Descartes' rule of signs, this, this polynomial has to have precisely one positive root. And so, this positive root of multiplicity one will be called its principal root. And the principal root is also can be shown to always be the largest. So for any complex root of this uh, polynomial, the size of the complex root will always be strictly below um, the principal root. So Binet introduced a very famous theorem that gives an explicit form for the Fibonacci sequence. So in particular, we have that the nth Fibonacci number is um, a sum of the nth powers of um, of phi and one minus phi, uh, where phi is the golden ratio, with a multiplicative scalar one over root five. And so we note that phi and one minus phi are actually the roots of the characteristic polynomial x squared minus x minus one for the Fibonacci sequence. So we wonder whether we can get a similar result for a generic PLRS using characteristic polynomials. And in fact, we can. Um, so if we use um, R1 through RK as the distinct roots of the characteristic polynomial of a linear occurrence H, um, and we write its multiplicities as well, then there are polynomials q1 through qk 
with degrees at most mi minus one, for which um, this equation holds. And so although it looks intimidating at first, we note that if h is a PLRS, then, and r is its principal root, then as m1 is one and r is the biggest, then the, Q, the, the q1, r1 to the n factor will by far dominate. And not only that, the q1 will, since it has a degree of at most zero, it's just a multiplicative scalar. So we have that this entire growth is controlled to be of order r1 to the n, since that's the dominating term. Using this generalized Binet's formula, we know that the growth of h sub n is essentially of order r1 to the n. And so the asymptotic growth of h sub n is totally determined by its principal root r1. So generally speaking, complete sequences must grow relatively slowly. Um, otherwise, it's just impossible to get every single positive integer. So can we somehow relate the size of r sub 1 to a completeness is the question. Um, in the following section, we will try to find, we will try to relate the bounds on the principal root to completeness. So we recall, first recall the definition of the characteristic polynomial as above. And then we see that the, um, and then we tried it, and then we showed that the positive, um, the principal root must be greater than one, because if it's, if it's at most one, then all of the other roots, which has modulus strictly smaller than the principal root, will, if we take the product of all its root counting multiplicity, we will get CL, and then we will get CL, the modulus of CL between zero and one, which contradicts the fact that it is a positive integer. So we also show the following lemma, which is that if HN is a complete PLRS, which has R1 as its principal root, then R1 cannot exceed two. The reason is that HN follows the, it, the, the reason is that R1 to the n is the, dominating, is the dominating term of Hn. And so if it's greater than 2, then at some point on, Hn will exceed the maximal sequence 2 to minus 1, which contradicts one of the theorems we stated earlier. Note that this is a necessary um, condition, but it's not a sufficient condition as we can find incomplete sequences with this root less than 2. Okay, so we asked ourselves is to is the best upper bound for the roots of, uh, of complete sequences and the answer is yes, because we can find complete sequences with um, the root with principal roots um, approaching to arbitrarily close and even those with size exactly two. However, this is still a fast method to check whether a sequence is definitely incomplete or possibly complete. So we can eliminate incomplete sequences. How do we do that? We know that the characteristic polynomial of APLRS crosses the x-axis. Uh, it only has one positive root, so it crosses the positive x-axis only once. So we want to see where does it cross it. It crosses it before two or after two. So what we can do is that we get we only have to evaluate the characteristic polynomial at two. And from there, we see we can find if we can see if the principal root is less than two, is two, or is greater than two. And this is much faster than checking ground criterion for each of the terms in the sequence. Okay, so now we have a threshold where if the principal root is above the threshold, then the sequence has to be incomplete. Uh, the the other similar question that we can ask is: Is there a similar threshold where? Um, if the principal root is less than this, then the sequence has to be complete. Um, and in fact, this bound must exist. Uh, to prove this, we note that there are finitely many sequences where whose, whose characteristic polynomial evaluated at two is greater than or equal to zero. Um, this is because if any coefficient of the sequence is greater than two to the i, where i is the index of the coefficient, then we must have that the characteristic polynomial evaluated to two is less than zero. So since there are only finitely many of these incomplete sequences with R1 with principal root um, less than or equal to two, we can just take the minimum over all of these sequences. And then if a sequence of length with L recurrence coefficients has a principal root smaller than this, it has to be complete. So what we're interested in finding now is the precise value of B sub L, which is this bound. 
Okay, so in order to try to determine the value of B sub L, we're going to use some combinatorial results about how we can modify sequences to either get a new incomplete sequence from an old incomplete sequence or a new complete sequence from an old complete sequence. So first, what we do is if we start with any incomplete sequence and we form a new sequence whose recurrence coefficients are the same, except that it has one fewer and the last new coefficient is the sum of the last two old coefficients. So if we take this new sequence with these new coefficients, um, this sequence is also incomplete, just as the first one was. So for complete sequences, um, the modification we make is just uh, subtracting anything from the last coefficient. So if we start off with a complete sequence and we decrease the last coefficient, um, as long as it's still positive, we still get a positive linear recurrence sequence. And if the original sequence was complete, then the new one will be as well. Um, however, an important thing to note here is that this doesn't work for any index coefficient. So for example, if you decrease the second coefficient, you could go from having a complete sequence to an incomplete sequence. And there are many examples of this happening. Uh, both of these results are proved just by working with Brown's criterion and arguing by induction. So we have proven this theorem, which is that for a sequence of length L starting with one, ending with N, and all the coefficient zero, this sequence is complete if and only if N does not exceed this bound. We also have the following conjecture, which is that every incomplete sequences has principal root at least the principal root of the given sequence. Note that it's just the sequence given in the preceding theorem where we take the bound of n and we add one at the last coefficient. So we denote the principal root of the of this um, special PLRS lambda L. So this conjecture given is equivalent to saying that the bound that we mentioned earlier, B L is actually lambda L for all L. And this is true for L less than or equal to 10 shown by computational data. So even in the event that this conjecture is false, there is asymptotic words on lambda L that gives um, useful information for BL itself. So this is a theorem we've proven, which is that um, the sequence of lambda L decreases as L tends to infinity. Additionally, as L tends to infinity, lambda L approaches one. Both of these results can be computed algebraically. And so if this conjecture is false, then we get VL is strictly less than lambda L, but is still greater than one. So by the sandwich theorem, um, the limit as L tends to infinity of VL is also one. And so we can get incomplete sequences that grows arbitrarily slowly. If our conjecture holds, however, we can have this asymptotic behavior of BL, which is L over two to the two over L. So while this remains a conjecture, there's been a significant avenue of our research for some time. And so we show some of the steps that have gone towards proving this. So we first showed that any sequence with, co with coefficients as given here, with a large enough sum of coefficients must have a root greater than lambda sub L. And so in particular, you know, if we, Say that it's sum of coefficients is greater than or equal to the si to two plus the bound, which is the sum of the coefficients of the ideal sequence shown before. Then we can use the following two invariant arguments. The first of which is that if we decrease any random term of the sequence and add one to the last term of the sequence, we will strictly decrease the principal root. And finally, if we have a second a second sequence which of the form one all zeros and then a positive integer and decrease that positive integer, we also strictly decrease the size of the root. So combining, these two, so combining these two ideas, we can essentially start from any sequence, um, apply the first bullet point iteratively until we end up with something of the form one, all zeros, and then S, and then apply the second, point, the second um, bullet point until we end up with this ideal sequence. Um, and so at each step, we will have strictly decreased the root. So therefore, any sequence, complete or incomplete, will, uh, with a large enough sum of coefficients, will have a root strictly larger than this one. So inducting for the general case, um, if we just start with any, with any incomplete sequence with a small enough sum, we want to show that its principal root is at least lambda sub L. So for the base case, we see that um, the only real candidates are 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3, and 3, 1, uh, with the roots written here. And the smallest of these corresponds to 1, 3, which follows the conjecture since the bound in this case is 2, and 2 plus 1 is 3. And then for the general case, we use 
strong induction, which, and so we suppose that the lemma holds for all lengths up to L, and then we let a sequence of length L plus one be incomplete with its, with its, some of its coefficients being have, uh, following this bound. And we show that um, it must have a sufficiently large root. So firstly, we show analytically that whenever you add a term to a coefficient, you strictly increase the root. And therefore, if we have that C1 through CL, so just the first L terms of this, co of this sequence, if that isn't complete, then by induction hypothesis, its root exceeds lambda sub L, which means that the following sequence, when you're out of coefficient, has an even bigger root, which of course exceeds lambda sub L plus one. And so we can eliminate the case in which the first L coefficients on their own are incomplete. And um, we can also eliminate the case where the first L coefficients have a large enough sum through a similar argument. And so we're reduced to a case where the first L coefficients are, in, are complete and are also have a bounded sum. We can actually extend this to say that all the partial sums are similarly bounded. And additionally, so using one of the combinatorial results we showed before, we have that if all the coefficients up to L plus one are incomplete, and then we can kind of truncate this by combining the last two coefficients and still get something incomplete. And therefore, something, and since the second sequence will have a root exceeding, a root exceeding lambda sub L by induction hypothesis, um, yet the root of the expanded sequence has a root below lambda sub L plus one, we can actually get the following inequality by comparing the characteristic polynomials. And so while well, this bound looks a little crazy at first, um, it is, we can show that each of these summons is strictly positive. And not only that, they're sufficiently large to force the first 32.5% or so of this coefficient CI to be identically zero. And then all experimental evidence in this regard um, within this individual subcase suggests that this must be true um, and check computationally for L up to 30. However, um, and essentially what we're getting at here is a situation in which um, the remaining subcase has, we force that all the first L coefficients be really small. And then the idea is that if the coefficients are sufficiently small, then in order to make C1 through CL plus one incomplete, CL plus one has to be huge. And in particular, it has to be much too big for the bounds on the sums of the coefficients to hold. And so just as an example of how this might work, if we just take a sequence that has one all zeros and then a positive integer, in this case with 19 zeros, um, we see that the bound on this positive integer is 116. However, if we add just a couple, not too many, but we just increase some of the some a couple of the coefficients in the middle, we actually see that the, the, the bound at the end grows significantly, in this case to almost 3,000. So in general, in these cases where most of the coefficients are zero, but only a few are increased, we see that the bound to make the sequence incomplete has to be huge and will break all the bounds. And while we haven't, well, we've shown some of this stuff for changing only a couple of the coefficients in the middle of the sequence, it's still the full general case just requires um, some significantly more asymptotic work. So now that we've talked about this lower bound where uh, sequences with roots below this bound are complete and an upper bound where sequences with roots above the bound are incomplete, we can ask what happens in between. And really in between is where things get very complicated and you have to use more combinatorial than analytic arguments to tell whether a sequence is complete or incomplete. So our main result to formalize this is one about denseness of these roots. So specifically, if we let RL be the set of roots of incomplete uh, positive linear recurrence sequences with L coefficients, um, we can, by, by taking L to be large enough, we can get arbitrarily dense sets RL in um, one, two. So in other words, sets that intersect any size of epsilon ball in uh, one, two. So as a result, um, immediately if we take the union over all of these different sets over, over the different lengths, um, this, the, the set that we're going to get as a result of, of these principal roots is dense in one, two, just because we can intersect any epsilon ball of any size. We'll quickly go over the proof of this theorem. We use the fact that the lambda sub L roots are decreasing and fulfill that their limit goes to one. So we can make, basically make this list of incomplete sequences. So for any L, we know that the first one is gonna be incomplete. And we can also show that the, that the last one must have a root that is above two. And we can also, we also know that the root of the first one approaches one asymptotically. So whenever we're given any epsilon, we can essentially pick an L large enough such that this first sequence on this list 
must have a root below one plus epsilon. And then, so we can show that any two consecutive uh, entries on this list will have roots that have difference at most epsilon. The difference between these consecutive entries will be actually decreasing uh, as they go up. And so we essentially have just a list of sequences which have roots which range all the way from one to over two. And it's the difference between any consecutive roots has to be less than epsilon. So we essentially intersect any possible epsilon ball inside that interval one to two. So we conjecture a similar result for complete PLRS. So if C is the set of roots of complete PLRS, then C is also dense in the interval from one to two. Although we have not been able to show this result rigorously, we suspect that a similar argument is possible where we consider a special set of sequences. For example, those of the form where we start with one and then zeros, ones, and then some n. Okay, so in conclusion, this is what we have found. First, a com computationally efficient way to check if a sequence is incomplete or probably complete. So if we evaluate the characteristic polynomial at two, the computational time is all L squared as compared to checking enough terms using Brown's criterion, which is a O to the O2 to the L problem. Also, we narrow down the precise interval where we have complete and incomplete roots interact. And also, we have um, proven that um, complete and incomplete sequences are evenly spaced throughout that interval one, two. In the future, we wish to prove the remaining conjectures in the presentation. For example, we wish to narrow down the precise interval where complete and incomplete um, sequences interact even more, say from VL to two. Um, thank you for listening and we are ready to answer any questions in the comments.